Good afternoon. Um, I'm Peter Bergen at uh, New America. Thanks for joining this event about big tech uh, content moderation, disinformation, uh, terrorism content. We are, we're joined by two of the uh, nation's leading experts on counterterrorism, David Cartenstein Ross, who's going to talk a, a little bit about a new paper that he's published, Redrawing the Lines and Assessment of the Impact of Anti-Censorship Legislation on Terrorist Content, Hate Speech, Harassment, and Mis-Disinformation. Uh, who's, he's also the CEO of Valens and um, a frequent um, testifier before congressional committees um, and uh, has worked for DHS and uh, is, has a PhD from uh, Catholic University. Um, and uh, also we're joined by Karen Greenberg, who is uh, um, heads the Center of uh, Center of National Security at Fordham University. Uh, she's had a, a long career. Um, writing about counterterrorism has written multiple books on counterterrorism. Her PhD was in history from Yale. She's also a senior fellow at New America. So, David, let's just turn to you if you could give us a high level account of, of your paper, and then we'll get into a discussion of the issues it raises. Thanks so much, Peter. It's great to join you. And uh, I, de I definitely appreciate uh, New America for hosting this discussion. I'd at the top like to acknowledge my two co-authors on this paper, Maddie Urban and Cody Wilson, uh, both of whom are in the audience today. So it's looking at this phenomenon called anti-censorship bills, which have been introduced at the state level and implemented in a couple of states and look like they're headed for a Supreme Court showdown in the not too distant future. As I think all of you know, uh, over the past you know, half decade plus, we've had two opposite trends online. One is there's been an absolute proliferation of harmful content, uh, disinformation and misinformation, terrorist content, hate speech, harassment, and social media companies have been called upon to deal with this harmful content, but at the same time, their role in doing so has become increasingly controversial. Um, this debate about the role of big tech in content moderation and in society reached a crescendo after President Trump was banned from Twitter and Facebook in January 2021 after the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, these bans were prompted by companies' assessment that Trump's postings posed a risk of violence. Uh, but even before these bans, uh, the anger of many political conservatives had been simmering due to perceptions that big tech's content moderation efforts were compromised by political bias. So you've had, in, in the wake of Trump's bans, anti-censorship bills um, that would constrain social media companies' ability to undertake content moderation, that is, you know, pulling material offline, banning accounts, or um, doing what's called shadow bans, uh, which is uh, making an algorithm not promote material. Um, Anti-censorship laws have been introduced in over a dozen states and have been passed into law in Florida with Senate Bill 7072 and in Texas with House Bill 20. So in, in the study, Redrawing the Lines, Maddie and Cody and I look at this through an adversarial perspective. If these laws were in place, what could an adversary do with it? And our basic argument is that HB 20 and SB 7072 go too far in imposing rigidity on platforms content moderation. Uh, essentially, bad actors, whether they're um, engaged in hate speech or misdisinformation or terrorist content, um, are very keen to exploit loopholes and um, exploit uh, a system which is constantly changing to adapt to them. Um, so just as an example of this, in Florida, uh, the limitations that are imposed by SB 7072 are that social media companies have to publish standards and definitions that the platform, and I quote, uses or has used for determining how to censor, deplatform, and shadow ban. Companies have to apply um, this, these, the, these takedowns in a consistent manner. They have to inform users about changes to rules ahead of times, and they can't change their rules more than once every 30 days. Um, Florida also provides that political candidates cannot be deplatformed and journalistic enterprises can't be deplatformed. 
it's when you kind of go past the surface and look at the net effect of this that the kind of mind-boggling nature of the attempt to constrain the platform becomes clear. Part of this is in volume, right? Like, for example, in the first three months of 2021, Facebook removed 8.8 .8 pieces of bullying and harassment content, 9.8 million pieces of organized hate content, and 25.2 million pieces of hate speech content. If they all become subject to litigation or to uh, a, a complex appeals process, then suddenly you have a system where content moderation really can't take place, um, especially, or, or let me put it a little bit more uh, constrained. It's very difficult for it to take place because of the volume of the material, the fact that each one could be subject to litigation, and uh, the damages that they have to pay out could be quite high overall, uh, given the volume. And um, you know, for another context, and then uh, then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up, is in the first three months of 2021, YouTube removed 1.16 billion con comments uh, that they found to be in violation of policies. Uh, so overall, what this does, what the what anti-censorship bills do is they are um, you know, a response to um, some real problems that do exist on the platforms, I would say. Um, right? Social media companies are not... Um, you know, simply actors who are innocent and have nothing to do with the problems that have occurred. But despite all of the problems, they're called upon to deal with real harms on their platform. And creating rigidity, uh, creating a right to sue, which um, is going to slow them down and make them very risk averse in terms of leaving bad content up, and creating certain loopholes like political candidate loopholes and loopholes for uh, journalistic publications. Um, when you actually game it out and look what an adversarial actor could do with it, um, it suddenly becomes a lot of different hoops that bad actors can jump through to make sure that their materials will remain online. Karen. Yeah, um, first of all, I want to say, Debbie, thank you for this wonderful report. It's really terrific. I'm going to give it to my class to read when we do section 230 and some other, so I think it's going to be very helpful just to set the context. And I kind of want to start there today, which is um, the context, which is that we are facing a number of issues as a country and as a globe where we keep getting to the point where we say it's too complicated, it's too complex, the legal uh, universe is just going to be so prohibitive and costly going forward. And I and all of these things, whether it's climate change, whether it's the globalization of economics, whether it's pandemic, I'm I'm really think that the issue of that we're facing at the internet with disinformation really brings together a lot of these issues about complexity. And I just want to put out there at the beginning that yes, it's complex, yes, it's complicated, but that can't be a substitute for it's too complicated. And while you know there is no magic wand. I also think we're going to have to make some really hard choices about benefits um, and 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 detriments that you know we might face going forward. So just to push back a little bit about the end of, of what you said, I I agree that they are there. No matter which path we choose, whether it's more content moderation, restrictions on content moderation, whatever it is, we're facing a very very long conversation that they are we're at the beginning of. And one of the things I wanted to point out was that other countries, other entities, other organizations outside of the United States have sort of given us a little bit of, of um, sort of a prelude to what to do and what not to do. And I, I'm thinking maybe of Germany's 2017 law criminalizing hate speech and some more legislation of this ilk more recently. Maybe in 2018, France passed legislation uh, to remove fake news during election campaigns. You see very little of this referred to in the American conversation. I think we need to own what's happening in the rest of the world more. This summer, the EU adopted the new Digital Services Act. Um, and then there are other countries like Turkey that passed a bill, I think last week, penalizing disinformation jailing journalists and social media users. And this is to your point, these laws can be used in a variety of different ways, right? But I still think it's instructive to look at these. And I think one another one that came to my attention recently was Uganda, which passed a bill banning false information and hate speech. So it's, it's not just us, it's all over the world in different kinds of countries for, as you said in the beginning, David, very different reasons. And I think we need 
to think about these laws in Florida and Texas in particular, the one in Texas being broader, um, uh, the one in Florida being more narrowly focused, but both important about you know, what the courts can do in terms of regulating content. And that of course involves what Congress can also do regulating content. Um, in terms of regulating content, I just wanna say the phrase anti-censorship is really fraught <laughs> because um, you know, censorship is the is is what the um, those who would like to you know promote this um, the the fact that you know there should not be content moderation is used, and so I, I prefer to say content res, uh, regulation than anti censorship only because it seeds to the censorship point, which is really not exactly all that this conversation was about, and I think sort of pushes aside some of the more important things that are happening. Another thing I wanted to bring up just at the beginning, and I, I don't want to go on forever, is that this moment has been coming for a long time. That, and the moment has very a lot of different parameters, but one is what is the, the real relationship going to be and between the public se sector and the private sector when it comes to the internet writ large and when it comes to disinformation for the purposes of this conversation. And part of what's happening in the courts is trying to figure out just what that relationship can be and should be. One thing about big tech is that big tech outside of the disinformation conversation and more directly in the privacy conversation is, is having a parallel conversation and they're not, they can't exclude one another. They, they're they're going to have, this is an evolving conversation, but just what right does the government have to intercede when it comes to speech, when it comes to uh, these platforms, is an issue as sort of a, a deeper issue that we need um, to, to, to address in the context of the longstanding you know, um, idea that government should not have too much interference when it comes to, to free speech, whether you call it publication, common carrier, whatever it is, we're not gonna get a, away from what it means to interfere with um, speech. Um, you know, I think we should also talk a little bit today about what happened with the disinformation governance board at DHS. I think it's really important. You know, it started what in April and it was declared over in August. And, um, you know, the idea was to study best practices for combating the harmful effects of disinformation. And I think while a number of NGOs have taken this up to look at what those harmful effects are and how to remedy them, how to counter them, how to prevent them, um, it's it's sort of um, a loss that we don't have, we haven't yet decided at the governmental level how to deal with or if to deal with the issue of um, disinformation. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up in this public-private conversation is, or at least that I'm, I'm raising here, is that there may be other ways to go about the same thing. And David, I'd really love to hear you on this. For example, do we really have to address content moderation in these particular forms or these cases? Or are there other ways that have to do with best business practices that have to do with um, something a, a number of critics have raised um, or students of um, disinformation, which is, um, you know, how do we how do we think about competition and um, antitrust provisions and monopoly in terms of what this means in terms of um, restraining um, uh, speech, um, you know, in ways that we're discussing, um, and also issues about privacy. Could we get at it in other ways that are not sort of trying to make some kind of very simple, oversimplistic and very, um, I think, um, long lasting and essentially to your point, destructive um, potential outcomes. So also there, I have many other things to say, but I think they'll come up in the conversation. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Debbie, for these opening comments. And I, I just want to remind the audience, you have a question. We're using Slido. It's lo located on the right side of the video. Just enter it and we'll answer your questions. Uh, after we've had a little discussion between the three of us. So, I mean, there was so much to ask about this quote, about this. You know, one, I, David, I thought the paper was was very strong and written in a very kind of um, accessible and interesting way. And you had an interesting way of describing misinformation, disinformation, lies, fake news, et cetera, and called it, called it polluted information, which I think is a nice way of kind of summarizing it. Um, and which relates to this question that, the Karen raised about you know the disinformation bureau at DHS was sort of dissolved. Um, so where to begin? Well, one one thing, um, David. I'm still. First of all, your your some of this research was was supported by Meta. What is what is their position on 
on what you're writing about? Uh, yeah, so obviously Meta opposes this. Generally speaking, any social media company is going to um, oppose uh, laws that um, you know threaten the way they go about doing business. I appreciate you uh, raising that caveat. Um, I will state also that um, though part of the research was funded by Meta, we also had you know free reign in how we wrote about the topic. Um, this this has been a fairly uh, long standing position that I've had on these bills. Well, so what is the um, what is what, what is the position you're advocating rather than the position that you're kind of opposing, as it were? I mean, you're you're saying that these Texas and Florida laws are sort of too intrusive or going to backfire or whatever. But like, what what is what's the affirmative position? Well, uh, what Karen mentioned before about best business practices is, I think, where the position is currently. Um, it's that. Um, Companies have complex relationships with a variety of governments. Uh, some governments, as Karen has pointed out, um, have laws that require much more in the way of content moderation. Uh, she mentioned Germany, she mentioned France, she mentioned Uganda. And so in those cases, there's going to be a much more restrictive regime. Karen also pointed to a number of places where the restrictions are not necessarily good restrictions. There's Turkey, there's a variety of countries um, which have, you know, blasphemy uh, type laws or, um, you know, or restrictions on criticizing the government. So you, you have all those different laws that are in place and social media companies have to comply with them from one country to another. But when it comes to countries that have relatively libertarian speech regimes, and the US is one, um, usually you'll have relationships between tech companies and a variety of stakeholders. Um, so if you look at uh, Meta, if you look at Google, if you look at Twitter, uh, they have relationship, they have public policy teams which have relationships with government. They'll have teams that have relationships with various civil society stakeholders, different groups, for example, that can be victimized by hate speech. And they'll have ongoing dialogue and figure out where they think the line should be drawn. My own view is that we're in this very dynamic moment where you have both um, a variety of, of kinds of toxic speech, harmful speech, then on the other hand, harmful desires to censor people who don't think like you do. Um, and all of that makes for an explosive cocktail. I personally think that, that also we should point out that the desire to censor on the one hand is very much at odds with the technological environment. We have a technological environment where at least until you have quantum computing breakthroughs, um, people can get a greater degree of anonymity in a variety of ways, end-to-end -end encryption. Um, it's easy to put speech up. There's too many different platforms by which you can get it out to the internet. And so with all of that, I personally favor um, a more libertarian approach in which um, companies are able to set their own different competing standards. I think it's fine that a company like Gab exists. I don't like Gab. Um, it, it, you know, it, it is one of the um, you know, most uh, dangerous places on the internet from perspective of everything that we're talking about, but it's fine that it exists. It's a place that people can decide to go to. Um, you know, if their policies cause people to die, um, then that's something that can be dealt with in other ways, right? And, and I think that there should be liability when people are um, putting up speech, which is designed to cause harm. So leaving all of that aside, um, the affirmative case at the end of the day is I think that um, I agree with, with Karen that, that, that complexity is not a reason necessarily to avoid government policy, but to me, complexity with competing imper imperatives tends to be a reason to allow some diversity of practice so we can get at best practices. And so I'm not for anti-censorship laws, uh, but also generally speaking, I don't see an imperative for government to require greater uh, content moderation either. Karen? That's a really interesting point because, you know, what, what you're really saying, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this kind of as a question, but is that, um, is that, this is something that is happening in this public space one way or another, that the internet has empowered it, and that in a way, there's not much we can do about it. Um, and so my, so my question to you is, do you think the internet has made this, and 
and I, and I really mean this, this isn't a rhetorical question, has made the spread of hate, which we've seen an awful lot of over the past century and violence in the name of hate, right? Let's not forget the 20th century not, and the, as well as the 21st. Do you, do you think we overemphasize the fact that um, it, the internet is a spreader of um, violence? And we know it's a spreader of disinformation, but in terms of the next step, violence, do you think that it's, it's, it's a game changer or, or not? I'm just trying to, you, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely think it's a game changer. And, um, you know, I, I don't think we overemphasize it. I think if anything, we underemphasize the degree of, of spread of violence. I, I think that, and so let me kind of um, divide up kind of two separate areas of thought. Really what I've devoted a lot of thought to is anti-censorship laws. And like, ultimately, I come down against them. Um, and, and Karen, I, I agree exactly with what you're saying, that um, it is a very fraught term. Um, so I should specify that I use the, the, the word that the words that were used in introducing them, I tend to use organic terms for, for different groups. And so like, you know, so-called patriot groups, I'll call patriot groups, right? They, like I let people use whatever term they want to describe themselves. But for these anti-censorship laws, um, I'm against them. Then there's this whole case of, well, should there be more obligations on social media companies? Just before this panel, um, before we got on, we were talking about litigation before the Supreme Court that maybe Section 230 doesn't provide protection when uh, terrorist content uh, inspires violence. The Supreme Court will be taking these cases up. And that's something where kind of the affirmative case is something I've done much less intellectual work on. But for the question of, do we overemphasize the role of the internet in fostering violence, absolutely we do not overemphasize it. Um, I think that it, there's a lot of different things that our digital lives are doing. I think it's it's altering patterns of radicalization. Uh, I mentioned my colleague, Maddie Urban, before this call. Uh, she and I are just finishing up a paper on what we call composite violent extremism, which we think is um, you know a new trend that is really driving driving a lot of violence in ways that just don't fully match at all pre-internet trends in, in violent extremism. Uh, and so this is a very important discussion for that reason. And we're captioned, like every discussion is captioned by alternatives. So my advice to big social media companies is generally speaking, they want to um, draw as big a tent as possible and to allow as many, um, as many uh, accounts as possible to be on their platforms as possible. Because if you drive people off of Facebook, if you drive people off of Twitter, they go to Gab, right? Or or or, altern or other alternative platforms, which um, researchers refer to as malevolent platforms. That creates a market space in which, you know, if 50% of people are driven offline, and obviously we're nowhere near that amount, nowhere near that, but if, say, you drive 50% of people off, to declare 50% of views off limits, then suddenly you create a huge market space for malevolent platforms. And I think even when you get into the case of um, government taking a role in determining that, hey, we need to draw more hate speech off, I, I totally get that. And you know, um, I think that part of what we have in the US is a lot of people don't trust government to draw the line right. Um, and I, I, I think without getting into a debate about that, um, I'll just say that if people feel that government is requiring a certain amount of content moderation and they don't agree with it, then there's lots of alternatives that they can use to still get things off onto the internet or to still read things that the government is trying to suppress. And that's part of the picture when we look at it beyond this more narrow corner of whether anti-censorship laws are going to cause problems or not. Yeah, I think that's right. I think this, right. I mean, even the way you sort of said it towards the end, I mean, the idea of government controlling reading, taking the libertarian, right, the, the government controlling reading, right, so, and some of the, you know, precedential cases in this regard that are used are sort of in that in that way. And, and of course, I agree with you that the internet has inspired more violence. And then the question is, is what to do. And I do think, although I know you see them as separate things, that when you look at Texas, Florida, 
um, uh, litigation and those cases versus what's happening in the Supreme Court, we're really poised right now to some major sort of, um, you know, changes in how we're gonna think about what can regulate the internet, what can't, what the best practices are. And so there's a couple of things in this regard. One is, what about this call for more transparency? More transparency on the part of big tech to say what they're doing, how they do it, what their criteria are. And there's been some movement in that direction, but overall there isn't this, you know, sort of broad sense of, of transparency. Do you think that more transparency will, and, and codified or regulated transparency um, about how these algorithms are done, what they've done that are available to, let's say, journalists, researchers, people like yourself, um, is, is, is some, one of a, a, a potential mitigating factor? I mean, I'm just curious where you would stand on that. I don't necessarily have a view on it. So um, as I mentioned, this report is written from an adversarial perspective, right? I wanted to look at how an adversary is going to look at it. Yeah. And if I'm looking at it from an adversarial perspective, what I would do with um, requirements of transparency is number one, um, I would you know, file litigation uh, as much as possible and um, try to get as many transparency reports as possible to know exactly where lines lie. Uh, and number two, I'd come through them very carefully uh, in order to um, determine exactly where the line is so that I can go right up to it and push out disinformation, misinformation, um, you know, terrorist content, while at the same time, not quite crossing the line. At the same time, there's lots of um, you know, valuable reasons to have transparency. So from an adversarial perspective, there's clearly something you could do with it. That doesn't really make it bad. Um, and obviously as a researcher, I do like transparency. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask you a question, which is, so, you know, there's been discussion of Section 230 and, and, and the case that the court is taking up uh, related to that. Can you explain to the audience what Section 230 is and, and why this case is important and, and what it could mean? Is this me? Yeah. Peter? Yeah. yeah. So let me so that basically Section 30 and I'm just, you know, kind of making it very simplistic, but, you know, basically says that, you know, you can you, you have um, um, immunity. Uh, if you're a, um, a platform, you have immunity from um, when it comes to content putting up or taking down. Right. And so that's why you see both the left and the right sort of talking about Section 230, because the I mean, I'm using the left and the right in, in broader terms than they actually mean. But you'll see, you know, people who lean Democratic wanting to have more moderation right under Section 230 and people on the right. Um, wanting to have less moderation also under Section 230. So it's a, and one of the things that's come up over Section 230, and, and you both will recognize this from prior cases that have to do with security versus, um, you know, security versus legal issues, is basically the sense of, you know, is this too vague a terminology? If it can be embraced by both sides for different reasons, then is this you know, is this too vague? How much does the language really help us understand what 230 is about? And that's why you have all these different kinds of cases. And so just to, to bring you up to date on the case that I think is really going to be on our in our sites coming up, which is Gonzalez v. Google, which is a Section 230 case, which is about, uh, which basically the question is, are recommender systems, in other words, that which comes through via algorithms in terms of how to push out a message and to whom to push it, um, um, are, are these, you know, are, are, do we, are they covered by the liability exemptions of Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act? Are they covered by it? And again, this is a question about where, what's the specifics and what is, and what's too general to be able to tie this down. And so it's come to the Supreme Court to, to look at this. And the case is one of that I'm, you know, that's really in our, all three of ours wheelhouse, which is the Paris attacks of 2015, carried out by ISIS, killing 130 plus people. An American student was killed, Nohemi Gonzalez. Uh, her family filed suit, claiming that YouTube, owned by Google, uh, the YouTube's recommender system, which pushes forth content according to users' profiles, were in part responsible for her death. Google claimed Section 230 as its defense. Um, saying it provides liability protection for content uh, as an internet service provider platform. The lower courts in this case have ruled in favor of Google. 
the family says, no, Section 230 doesn't cover this kind of content moderation. Um, and so really what this, this argument, this case, this decision will be about when it comes to uh, Gonzalez v. Google is, does Section 230 extend to these algorithms presented by the recommender systems? And actually, when you, I mean, to David's point about, you know, how much has changed, when you watch the degree to which technological, understanding technology is so important to be able to rule on this um, decision, I'm sure you, you, you remember in the early days of prosecutions about terrorism, like who was going to explain what was going on in terms of terrorism, who the terrorist groups were, how they were affiliated, how they were funded. And, and we're still in the same place here over technology, even though we're so many years later. So it's actually a very important case and it could have some very dire consequences, which I think David um, referred to before. Well, question for both of you. So in David's paper, he makes the point, and it kind of goes to what Karen was saying, and David was agreeing with I, I, this question of, so, you know, ISIS recruited 40,000 Muslims from around the world to come, and, and David's paper says, you know, it's the, it's the biggest wave of sort of foreign fighter um, instigation, even bigger than the Afghan war against the Soviets. So I think we're all in agreement that the internet had an effect on this wave of it's just a fact right so it's sort of it's an so if, if that's a fact and that the social media had this you know very big recruitment effect for isis then you know how, how does that affect this gonzalez versus google debate because clearly social media companies did have a role in uh recruiting people to isis and inciting violence Well, in a way, and then I'm going to, Debbie, you should, you know, but I just want to say the other case, Twitter versus Tomna, actually speaks directly to that as well. You know, it's specifically the question there is, when is a company liable for abetting terrorism? You know, ISIS posted recruiting, fundraising stuff on Twitter, other social media platforms. And um, the case here is brought by, um, on behalf of a Jordanian citizen who was killed in 2017 during an, in Istanbul uh, during an ISIS uh, attack. So that's, that is really the question. And Twitter says the lower courts improperly expanded the scope of the Anti-Terrorism Act. But to, to your point, Peter, it's, it's this isn't, this is really the question in the uh, Tomna case. And they're deciding them, you know, these are gonna be decided together. They were decided together by the Ninth Circuit. Um, um, and it, they're seen as a package to, to, to see both sides of this, both in terms of how you target the user for what you send out and in terms of what you actually um, put online in, in these case, in terms of recruiting and fundraising. And I think probably the ramifications for that will go well beyond that because what is also put online is disinformation. And so this is going to be a very, no matter what happens, the implications of these things, if they're, if they're misused of these decisions, could be much broader than the cases themselves. And I think that's what a lot of um, about civil liberties uh, advocates are worried about. But David, what do you, I know you have some really good thoughts about these cases. What do you think? Yeah, so first of all, to Peter's point, the causal effect is clear, right? The fact that um, the ability of ISIS to recruit or to carry out certain attacks was linked to their use of the online space. I think that's very clear. Um, Karen mentioned uh, elliptically a little bit earlier that that I saw these as separate issues because uh, we we're talking about this just before coming on. Uh, but what I was saying is that I see the, the, both of the cases that we're talking about, the Gonzalez case and um, the case versus Twitter um, as coming from the opposite direction of anti-censorship laws. They're actually very much linked. They're just coming at it from, from completely different perspectives. So anti-censorship bills um, are designed to make it harder to pull down content. If you pull down content, you can face liability. The lawsuits are designed to create an imperative to take down content. If you leave content up, you can face liability. And so to put it back in the content of anti-censorship laws, I think one thing we're looking at is, uh, you know, I wouldn't say even the potential. I think we have a reality that social media companies have very, and tech companies writ large, but especially social media companies have very competing imperatives across different jurisdictions. 
And with the Supreme Court cases and then the anti-censorship bills or anti-content moderation bills, um, they could have within the United States competing imperatives. Liability for leaving content up if the Supreme Court design, decides that Section 230 does not protect them from liability and also liability potentially for taking con to content down if the two anti-censorship laws go into effect. Um, so to me, that's uh, the area of intersection that you potentially have in a real way competing imperatives put on the companies at the same time in the same jurisdictions, which is interesting. Yeah. Switching gears a bit. So um, obviously a lot of content moderation is already probably being done by AI and that will kind of increase geometrically. Um, what are the you know positives or, or negatives of that? I mean, I think that the positives and negatives are, you know, basically the same, right? So the positive is that it allows content moderation at scale. Um, you know, and, and when you're looking at, I mentioned before, the 1.16 billion YouTube comments that were pulled down in a three-month period. Obviously, you're not going to do that through human content moderation. There's no company that's going to hire a workforce big enough to um, pull down 1.16 billion comments in a three month period. Um, and then the negative is that when you do content moderation at scale like that, it's going to be um, you know, very rough and imprecise. Uh, comments that are innocuous will sometimes be pulled down. Um, I think most anybody who has ever had an argument on social media will have some experience of something pulled down uh, that probably shouldn't have been. Um, and on the other hand, um, you'll have a lot of material stay up that maybe violate terms of service. Um, so I think that that that's the positive and the negative, and they're both uh, flip sides of the same coin. You know, somehow I feel like we're missing a part of the conversation, which is you know, we're putting all of this burden, which is impossible, as you just described it, onto these social media companies, um, putting it on you know, our legal institutions to figure it out one way or another by, by punitive measures, by constructive measures, preventive measures. But there's another side of this, which is um, educating the user. And I know there's a lot of talk about this, digital citizenry and, you know, but actually, it seems like a very important part of this, which is so, but that presupposes that people care whether information is disinformation or not, right? Hmm. So what I'm really trying to suggest here is that we're in such a tense, divided, this is not, you know, rocket science, um, period of our, of our history, uh, this moment, that it's sort of exacerbating all of these issues. And I'm just wondering if, if, if we think about the deeper causes of all of this anger and hatred and 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 just cruelty, um, do we need to be thinking about that? Not putting it on the tech companies, but really need to understand just how interrelated these two things are, or is that too sort of um, you know wishing for something we also can't fix? And at least this we can try to amend one way or another. Peter, what do I'm you gonna, think about that? I'm going to make a little pitch for. Colleagues of ours at New America, Peter Singer and Lisa Gunsey, are working with the state of Florida, you know, for to create, you know, to help digital literacy for kids, you know, and, and clearly that's a at least partial solution. Yeah, and for me, I I don't think it's unrealistic to say that, Karen. I mean, it, it might sound unrealistic, um, you know, given that we're in this kind of deeply divided uh, period. But so one point I make frequently uh, to people I know at tech companies who work in disinformation is that I think the contentiousness of an issue and the degree to which people feel like they're not heard or that they're shouted down has an impact on their susceptibility to disinformation. That if you had more of an even tone and less of a contentious tone, that you probably would have less uh, susceptibility to disinformation. And you know, we can bear this out just by looking at 
um, you know, Russian information operations. Um, like we know for a fact, based on voluminous evidence, that Russia would um, have operatives on various sides of issues. Um, so like a, a good example in the pre-COVID era and also in the COVID era, but pre-COVID would be um, anti-vax debates where they would have both you know, um, operatives associated with the with the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, who would um, post you know, anti-vax posts. Then you'd have these other IRA operatives posting completely obnoxious pro-vaccine posts, and you know, both of them would just ramp up the ramp up the volume and the heat on that debate. Um, so I think that that literacy is important, um, and there you know we're talking about political bias in the context of content moderation. So um, one thing that I think is very important is that any digital literacy effort cannot be a partisan effort, right? Um, and I, I've seen a number of places where questionable decisions are made in terms of what's in, what is information versus disinformation. I talk about a couple in um, in the paper, but like, let's, let's kind of, I wanna put on the table that when the lines are drawn wrong by companies, or by governments that are engaging in kind of efforts to educate, that very much deepens distrust. So I'd want to see this be absolutely nonpartisan. Uh, and then the second thing I, that I think is important in the 21st century is we need to kind of rehumanize one another. I think one of the big problems that you get on digital platforms is people are just routinely dehumanizing to people who have you know, a slightly different view about the world than they do. Um, you know, I, I understand that it's very easy when we're in a digital medium to see other people as not real. Um, and I think you have these escalating cycles of dehumanization where someone like, let's take the anti-vax debate again, this one that I like because um, it, it's one that I like for a variety of reasons, including that um, it, to some extent, it's not really linked to partisan issues. If you look at where anti-vax debates were prior to uh, COVID, you had kind of this faction on the left, kind of like the the uh, like kind of California uh, neo hippies, and then this faction on the right who were both you know anti-vax. So it sort of spanned the political spectrum. And there, let's say someone's vaccine hesitant, and they say they they express this and have people kind of lash out at them, you know, accusing them of endangering kids, et cetera, they feel dehumanized. And like, in turn, they might feel, okay, they might A, be more susceptible to anti-vax uh, disinformation, and B, they might be much more likely to in turn dehumanize someone else. So I think that, that digital literacy is important, but also I, I definitely would just lay a stake down on rehumanization of one another, which I think is absolutely possible in the digital realm. It's all a question of digital ethics. And that's also a second set of digital ethics in, in addition to better digital literacy that I would 100% like to see fostered. Well, relatedly uh, for both of you. So in three weeks, we're gonna have this midterm election, which I think uh, I may sabotage a number of the uh, wishful, uh, hopeful uh, messages we've just been talking about. Um, and then of course we have 2024. So, I mean, I, is it possible to assess how things are going? And just, I mean, this is a very broad question, but I mean, you know, is it is the situation worse, better, the same in terms of misinformation, uh, polarization around these events? I mean, what's your anticipation about, you know, the risk of political violence around these events that generated by social media? And of course, you know, what, what does 2024 look like? I know those are very hard questions to answer, but but that's why you're on the panel. <laughs> Karen, you want to take first cut there? <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll take the first short shortest cut. Um, one thing, okay, so let me just put in a plug for what the Biden administration has been doing. That This is not a, a, a policy or a problem that they're ignoring. There have been so many things done in true Biden fashion, you know, quietly, so many offices set up about disinformation, so many, except for the disinformation board, um, you know, CIS is, you know, acknowledging these issues and you know, proactively trying to think how to deal with them. Um, so I, I think that's actually a positive sign that 
people are paying attention and, and I think is a very responsible way. How effective that can be, it's certainly more effective than not paying attention and paying attention too late. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and I just want to bring this carve out here, and I'm interested in, in what you think about this, is that, you know, the cases before the Supreme Court, um, and don't worry, I'm not changing the topic, but the cases before the Supreme Court are about international terrorism, which is very interesting because they're going to make a decision about this, you know, disinformation environment based on something that is really a nonpartisan issue, really, you know, in, in which there is sort of coherence about um, countering um, international terrorism. And what you're really saying is, okay, is, is this going to mean anything for the current um, environment? And I'm not sure. And I think if it does have an impact, let's say on the 2024 election, it may not be a good one, depending on what the court decides. So your question is something to very much um, keep in mind. Um, but I love this term, digital ethics. I think it's great. I think I think it's um, it's a little bit late to the game, but I think it's a really wonderful way to start thinking about things. Um, you know, it's a wish and a prayer in terms of the elections, Peter. I can't. I want to. I don't want to say anything negative, so I'll leave that for David to, <laughs> to, to weigh in. Uh, people always leave me to say the negative things. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of your question, Peter, I think that there are two uh, trend lines going in different directions. Um, one would be the social media companies' trend line, and the other would be the societal trend line. Uh, for social media companies, I think 2014 to 16 was a low point in terms of both terrorist content and also mis and disinformation. Um, terrorist content with respect to ISIS in particular and mis disinformation around the 2016 elections. Since then, I think social media companies have moved in a more positive direction. I, I don't even use the term cleaned up their act because I don't think anyone would buy that. But I think that in terms of terrorist content, um, they're far better than they were at ISIS's height. Uh, and in terms of mis and disinformation, they're better than they were in 2016. Um, but how you know what they can do is captioned by the other trend line, which is our societal trend line is very negative. Um, if you look at polarization and distrust, you know they're at all time highs. Um, distrust in almost every institution across the board. And then secondly, we have a fragmented information uh, ecosystem, um, which is so highly fragmented that um, sometimes on certain stories, um, I realize that unless I read, you know, four or five different articles, I'm not going to get at what's going on uh, because you have like multiple publications that are giving completely different perspectives on the same thing, you know, again, depending on what the topic is. So I think those two issues of the fragmented information ecosystem and polarization distrust um, push us in a direction where it's really hard to get an overall handle on, on mis or disinformation. They tend to exist most virulently at times of high distrust. Yeah. Let me ask let me ask a question from the audience here, which is, you know, there's been a lot of focus on terrorism. Um, to what extent are the recent driving political forces of anti content moderation arguments not terrorism related, but relate to COVID misinformation or about or, or debates around teaching what opponents have framed as critical race theory? So to what I guess so? Yeah, I mean, is this being driven by uh, COVID? Is this being driven by what some worried that people are being taught the wrong thing, things in school or what what are the drivers here for this the anti-censorship quote unquote legislation yeah the the biggest drivers are political um clearly um so let me kind of make the strongest case possible for them because i think that when you're um trying to articulate the reason you have to make the strongest case possible um so after trump uh, was taken offline. Um, you had um, a Republican senator, um, Lindsey Graham, weigh in, uh, Twitter may ban me for this, but I willingly accept that fate. Your decision to permanently ban President Trump is a serious mistake. The Ayatollah can tweet, but Trump can't, says a lot about the people who run Twitter. And you can look at, at various other uh, cases of kind of um, what we could call whataboutism, but let's call it um, what aboutism that has a legitimate point that Trump has taken offline 
And there are multiple other figures who um, are were clearly their social media platform is part of how they're trying to do harm and they're not taken offline. Then you have two other things which one could point to um, as where the line was drawn poorly. Uh, one of them would be the Hunter Biden laptop story, which came out just before the 2020 election. Um, you know, the New York Post reported on Hunter Biden's laptop. Later on, you'd have uh, both the Wall Street Journal and New York Times after the election uh, come out with stories about Hunter Biden's laptop. Uh, I don't want to get into all of the details there, but, you know, I, I think that for, for me as not an expert observer of Hunter Biden's laptop, it seems that the line there was drawn wrong, that the story was taken offline as disinformation, hacked material. And then later on, the New York Times and Wall Street Journal reported something that was you know, very similar with perhaps a few differences, and that was deemed okay. Then a third thing that we, again, we talk about this in the study, is the way that the Wuhan lab leak hypothesis for COVID-19 was suppressed by social media companies as disinformation. And I called out at the time that that almost certainly seemed to be wrong. There was no reason, like it did not make sense to me that you couldn't discuss the Wuhan lab leak hypothesis. And then, you know, flash forward another year and the Biden administration is looking at it as one of the two most likely explanations for COVID, the other one being natural causes and um, social media companies reverse their position. Now, I think all of those give fuel to this. I mean, the other cultural issues, um, you know, critical race theory is mentioned, and that uh, falls in line with people feeling that perhaps the state is imposing a new ideology and at the same time using censorship, including through soft power means, to try to uh, get rid of opposing views. So all that together, I think, comprises some of the backdrop here that people feel um, that there is unfairness uh, in terms of who is taken offline and who isn't. They feel that uh, oftentimes social media companies draw the line wrong. And finally, they feel that uh, there's kind of an informational cultural shift that's being driven by government. And if big tech is a censorious arm of government, then suddenly you have both governmental power and soft power institutions implementing that. And so I think that all taken together is some of the driving mindset behind it. Obviously, I'm against the laws, and so I could provide some counters, uh, but I think that's the, the strongest case I would make for them. I kind of think that a lot of things you described are symptoms rather than causes, and that the last thing that you sort of came to, which is this real sense of dislocation, disenfranchisement, is really central to these other issues of and angers and and expressions of um, you know hate that there really is a, this grievance culture which is takes a variety of different forms that you've described really has to do with the, the point to which the United States has come and a lot of it has to do with wealth uh, distribution um, and and people feeling a loss of of sort of ability to move ahead with their lives. And I, I, I think that is beneath all these other things you said about who has access to the vaccine. But I wanna come back to something else that's kind of been here. And I, I just wanna make this point. You said, sometimes when you're, you see something, you have to look to three or four more sources to see if it was good or you know what, what's right. And I think a lot of us are in this moment. And I wanna suggest that maybe that's not such a bad thing that the idea that you have to challenge, when we talk about digital literacy, right? It's not just knowing which websites it, it, it's to go on to. It's to know how to think about the world we're living in, who's saying what, what it, what it actually means. And I think we're at a moment where this sort of critical thinking about absolutely everything before us, which is so frustrating, um, is, is not a bad stage for us to have, us as a culture and a series and a, and a variety of communities to have to go through. Now, again, maybe that's unrealistic, but this is this is new. Um, and, and it's really the only way to get through the bombardment of information um, and the whole spectrum of information. Do you think that's two rose-colored glasses? <laughs> I, I don't think it's too rose-colored. Um, for me, it's a matter of time triage. My frustration more than anything is 
you know, I'm a busy CEO, I'm running a company, and I, I don't really have time, generally speaking, to read through half a dozen articles to figure out what's going on on a topic. Um, and so, you know, when I realized that reading a couple of sources is probably going to confuse me more than it enlightens, I'll usually take a low information diet approach to that. Um, but I did want to highlight one thing that you said, Karen, because uh, I know that we're, we're right out of time, but I, I agree with you strongly um, about um, kind of an underlying driver. Um, there's a book by Edward Cornish called Futuring. Edward Cornish is a famous futurist. He's now, uh, he's dead now. But um, one of the, what he calls a super trend, like an overarching trend that affects the globe that he identifies is increasing deculturation or loss of traditional culture. And the way he describes it, deculturation occurs when people lose their culture or cannot use it because of changed circumstances. Um, you know, we experience deculturation when we go to a country where people speak a language we don't understand or do things differently from what we are used to. Many people today experience culture shock without ever moving to a foreign country. Instead, a new culture takes over much of their homeland with the result that the original inhabitants become surrounded by people who do not share their culture. And he doesn't just mean through immigration or demographics, but it can also just be by culture shifts, um, you know, that are occasioned by, you know, universities or elite institutions or the like. And so to me, like, um, you know, occasionally we, we dive into deculturation and its relationship to terrorist trends and the like. Um, I, de I definitely would, would underscore the idea that deculturation is one of those major factors that's driving polarization in the country. And with respect to what I said earlier about humanizing, rehumanizing one another, um, I think that that the more we can try to understand underlying causes and be compassionate about very different perspectives during this wrenching time, the better we'll be able to navigate some of these effects, these, these poisonous effects arising from them, like people buying into myths and disinformation, uh, people turning to violent extremist movements and the like. Taryn, any quick final thoughts in the next two minutes? No, I mean, I, I, I do think we're in a, a moment of tremendous grievance on all sides. I don't think we can go backwards. I think we have to go forwards. I think all of these uh, challenges that the courts are taking up in terms of Section 230 and the larger issues of um, how what speech protections are in this current environment are incredibly important. But I think that the that the actual solution to this lies outside of the particular topic in the larger context. And you know, if there's any takeaway from from this conversation, this idea of I don't even want to say rehumanize, but the, this idea of humanizing the world we live in when we're having a discussion about um, big tech <laughs> is actually, I think, um, something we all need to give a lot of thought to. Yeah, one final observation perhaps is that, you know, political violence is the American story. Uh, periods of non-political violence are the aberration, not, not the norm. I'm always a reminder of Charles Sumner, you know, who was nearly beaten to death on the floor of the Senate in 1856. And because we constantly sort of talk about, let's get back to how we once were, and that was the, you know, We've, we've, we've always been at odds with each other. I'm not sort of advocating the position, I'm just stating it. And, and I think that we tend to sort of overemphasize the moments of, of, of comedy, uh, which are actually kind of unusual. And I, <laughs> I mean, we can only hope that there's more, more comedy in our future. Um, but I, you know, uh, as an historian uh, by at least temperament, I'm skeptical. Anyway, I want to thank our brilliant panelists, David Gardenstein Ross and Karen Greenberg. This was an uh, extremely stimulating conversation. Thank you also to the audience for listening and for the questions and uh, look forward to seeing you at our next event.